before we begin, let's have a little word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your word. As we open it today, I pray that the Spirit will speak to our hearts. And speak through me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every time we pray, you know, it's a humbling experience. We ask God to help us, right? We can't do it ourselves. Without me, you can do nothing. So, uh, Matthew chapters 21, 22, and 23. These are some of the last conversations that Jesus had with the, with the Jewish leaders. And then we have Matthew 24 coming right after that. Matthew chapter 24. The old is past. Jesus is looking forward now. He's answering some questions about his second coming. Matthew 24. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 4. We read this a lot. This is, uh, this is a very important passage. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 4. Matthew 24, verses 1 to 4. Jesus is there with the disciples. He just had these conversations with Jewish leaders. And uh, the disciples are showing him the beauties of the temple and the city. And notice what Jesus says. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be one left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Wow, that's an amazing, amazing uh, comment that he makes here. And then Jesus begins to answer their questions. And uh, huge is the problem of deception in the end time. It's the first words out of his mouth. Uh, there's all kinds of theological weirdness going around all around, all around the world. Uh, and it's an amazing thing. And Jesus begins to talk about the troubles coming on the earth as a, result, as, as a result of rejecting truth, rejecting him who is truth. So what is the mechanism by which we could be deceived? You know, Jesus in this passage says that even the very elect are perhaps in danger of being deceived, right? So what is the mechanism of deception? Let's turn to it. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 9 to 11. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 11. I'm interested in this because I don't want to be deceived. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not a love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What is the punchline in this verse? They receive not a what? Love of the truth. When you learn a new truth, grab a hold of it. Wrap your arms around it. Don't let it go. Take the stake and pound it deep. Because the devil has a big foot. And he'll kick it out from under you if you're not careful. Then we have this passage in Matthew 24, verses 14 and 15. Matthew 24, verses 14 and 15. Following along now, Matthew 24 is a, is a tremendous passage for us to understand and read often because he's answering the disciples' question, what will be the sign of your coming and what? The end of the world. Okay. Verses 14 and 15. Matthew 24, 14, and 15. I'm glad to see so many Bibles. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
Stand in the holy place. Whoso reads, let him understand. The first comment I want to make about that last verse is that Jesus understood who Daniel was. He called him Daniel the what? The prophet. If Daniel's the prophet for the end time, then where should we be spending a lot of our time? Studying the book of Daniel, right? Some have questioned whether Daniel really lived back there 600 years, 600 years before Christ. Porphyry in the second century said he couldn't have done that. He couldn't have written the things that are in Daniel 11, for instance, so far back. But it's been shown now that Daniel is a historic figure living in the 600s B.C. The second thing about this passage is that these verses, verses 14 and 15, go together because they are separated by the word therefore. Jesus says, the gospel in all the world, then the end will come, and then he talks about therefore, the abomination of desolation being set up. So these verses go together because they're separated by the word therefore. Desolation was coming, and many lives would be lost. Jesus said, when you see the desolator standing where he not, ought not to stand, get out of your normal routine and flee from the wrath to come. Abomination of desolation. I want to spend some time on that idea, on that idea today. In the first century, the abomination of desolation was the Roman army that destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Let's take a look at Luke 21. Luke 21 actually is a chapter that's, that is uh, a corollary to Matthew 24. We can learn a lot from studying and comparing these, uh, these gospels and these passages from Matthew 24, Luke 21. Mark 13 has one as well, same one. Uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20 and 21. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is what? Near. Talking about the desolation here. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of, the, of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there too. For these be days of vengeance. So... <clears throat> Roman armies, thousands of Jews perished when the Roman armies came under Titus and uh, destroyed the city. Jesus uses this tragic event as a, an example of the end of the world. When a terrible desolator would come and kill and seal and destroy again. Only this time it's not going to be in the first century. When will it be? It'll be with the final generation of earth's history. Clearly, Jesus is talking about both events. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the end of the world when Jesus comes. That was what the disciples asked. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Again, I'd like to read Matthew 24, 14 and 15. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and what then? Then shall the end come. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso reads, let him understand. So, <clears throat> the previous verse says that when the gospel goes to the world, the end would come. Then he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation that makes desolate, the abomination that makes desolate, taking residence where he ought not to be, pay attention. That's what he's saying to them. That's what he's saying to us this morning. That's what he's saying to the first century Jews and Christians. Now I'd like to have us take a look at Re Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. One of my dear friends gave me a new Bible. It's just wonderful. It's easy to turn to text. It's small enough that it works really good. I can just lay it here on the pulpit and I can, and uh, it's just wonderful. Revelation 12, 17, we're all familiar with this one. It says, and the dragon was angry with the woman. Who's the woman here in this verse? God's church. Woman represents church, right? And the dragon 
was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan, of course, is the, is the great desolator. He is the great desolator. And he's angry with God's church. The church is the apple of his eye. God's eye, right? Why does he love the church so much? Because the church is his representative in the world. The church is his ambassador to all those who haven't heard the good news, right? And when all have heard the good news, what happens next? The end will come. That's why the church is so important. That's why the devil is so angry. And when Satan comes like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, the wrath is vented on God's church. He's standing in God's place when he attacks the church. He's standing in God's place, the one thing that God prizes above everything else in this world is his people. It's like the final straw. It's like uh, the stick in the fire. Then comes Revelation 13, right on the heels of this chapter. Revelation 13, right after Revelation 12, 17, which describes in detail how the devil will work through, the earthly, through an earthly desolator to get rid of as many as he can of God's elect, either by deception or by force. doesn't matter to him, one way or the other. You know, even at the end of the millennium, when the wicked are all destroyed, there's no honor among thieves, right? He tries to destroy them too. He's mad because he couldn't do anything about it during the millennium. <laughs> Can you see him there with the arguments that must take place between the devil and, and, the, and the fallen angels during the millennium? All of these things. So he's angry at the human family because the human family started out being made in God's what? Image. Whenever he sees you, he's reminded of God, especially if you're a Christian. The final straw will, will, be, will be when God's name is desolated and the image of the beast is formed, as is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. To desolate God's church. From the very beginning, it has been Satan's purpose, purpose to overthrow the law of God. Why do you think he's so angry at God's law? Because the law is a transcript of his character, his character of love. The Bible says love is the what? Fulfilling of the law. If you want a good definition of, the, of love, it's in Romans, the 13th chapter. It mentions some of the commandments there. And it says if there be any other commandments, it says to keep the law is to love your neighbor. Lloyd, if I love you, I won't steal to you, right? Steal from you. And Steve, if I love you, I won't lie to you, right? That's the height of love. All kinds of definitions of love in the world today. But the character of God, God will never do those things to you. That's how he loves you. He loves you from his heart, and he wants us to appreciate that too. From the very beginning, it's been God's purpose to overthrow the law of God, and the law of God is the place of God's name. That's where his name is located, in the law. In fact, right in the very heart of the law is God's name. The law is the foundation of every government. God has a law too, and he has a government. And uh, a usurper comes in and claims to change God's times and God's laws. Let's look at it. Daniel. Jesus knew Daniel very well. I think he was a, of a student. Actually, the inspiration for Daniel came from, from him centuries before, right? Before he came to this world. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Daniel 7, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And she think to do what? Change times and laws. 
Now, he's speaking words against the Most High, so these are God's times and God's laws. Sounds like great trouble to me because God's laws and his ways are already perfect. They don't need anybody tampering with them. Let's read from Psalms next. Psalms 19, 7 to 10. Psalms 19, verses 7 to 10. I see some of you have it, have it on your phones and some of you have it in the book. I wonder who gets it first. Probably the one on the phone, right? <laughs> I'm still looking and Jim's sitting there with a big smile on his face. Psalm 19, 7 to 10. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Why would anyone want to change that? The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Don't need changing. Who would want to come and change all that? Yet he does. And that's what the desolation is. It takes peace from the earth. It takes the gold of faith and love from the earth. It robs from men the sweetness of God's character. When you, when you neuter the law by taking God out of the law, his name out of the law, when you neuter that, you have taken the sweetness of God's character from the earth. That's what God's law is. It's a transcript of his character. And you know what? He wants to write that in our hearts. He wants us to be sweet and good like he is. The moral integrity of the cosmos is at stake here. Desolation indeed. You know, the angels who have never fallen, they're very interested in this plan that God has made to save the family of humans. Because really God in a way is, is being judged here, right? The whole universe is looking on. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. This is near the end of the book. Not John the Gospel, but 1 John. 1 John 5 verse 3. One time in a Bible study said somebody, somebody said, is it the real John? It's not the real John, but it's written by John. 1 John chapter 5 verse 3. It's the close. 1 John 5 verse 3. Okay, here's what it says. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? Grievous. His commandments are not grievous. The love of God is that we keep his commandments. You take love from the earth, and what, of a, des what a desolation you have. The Bible says love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, 10. The Bible said that love works no, no ill to God. That's the first four commandments. Thou shalt have, not have any go other gods before me. Don't make graven images. Don't take my name in vain. And keep Sabbath holy. Wow, that's how we love God. Our neighbor. <clears throat> the last six commandments. Jesus summarized the law that way. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he says, your neighbor is yourself. Two commandments, he said, I give to you. And that's it. That's how we love. So God's name, God's character, his authority has been robbed from earth people. Because a desolator has been at work. Exodus chapter 20. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. There's his name. The seventh day is what? The Sabbath of what? The Lord. the Lord thy God. That's the place of his name. Several places in the Old Testament. It says the sanctuary is the place of God's name. 
Where in the sanctuary is God's name? Most holy place, right? Right in the very heart of the law of God. Notice with me Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter 22. Verses 31 and to 33. Leviticus 22, 31. My fingers don't work as good as they used to. Leviticus 22, 31 to 33. Here's what it says. Neither shall you profane my holy name, that I will be, I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the what? The Lord which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God, I am the Lord. Now down in Isaiah chapter 41, let's turn to Isaiah 41. Ah, oh, that time gets away so quickly here. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm sorry, it's 42, verse 8. Notice what it says. This is an interesting verse. It comes right in the heart of a whole lot of things. I am the Lord. That is my... What does it say? I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will not, and I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. The word Lord is the one we commonly use for Jehovah God. The word Lord is used over 7,500 times, 7,500 times in the Bible. Page after page in the concordance, the word Lord. What an important name recorded in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, the very heart of God's law is the Lord's name in the fourth commandment. Now, <clears throat> I believe that in the sanctuary in heaven there is a mercy seat. There's an ark, right? And in that ark is God's holy law. And right in the heart of that law is the fourth commandment. I believe there's a, a halo around it because God's name is there. It's the place of God's name, the fourth commandment. The third commandment leads right up to it. It says, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord thy God, what? In vain. In vain. And then it names the name of the Lord in the fourth commandment. These two commandments are related. Great guilt hangs on this. Desolation indeed. Because the next commandment is where God's name is. The last message to the world before Jesus comes. Let's read it. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The last message of mercy to the world before Jesus comes. How do we know it's just before Jesus comes? This is a magnificent chapter. It lays out the three angel messages. And then, near the end of the chapter, it describes the second coming. These three messages are, are the message of the church today for the world. If a church is not preaching this to the world, they're not preparing the world for the second coming. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel. Angel here means messenger. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is a repeat of Matthew 28, only it's in the framework of the judgment. Notice the next verse. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is what? Coming? Come. 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 When this message goes forth, there's a judgment going on in heaven and on earth. The message is going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. This is a direct quote from the fourth commandment. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and fountains of waters. This commandment is the place of God's name. God made the Sabbath for a reason. He made it holy for a reason. 
for only God is holy. Nothing could be made holy without his presence in it. That's why the law is holy. That's why the Sabbath is holy. The burning bush was holy and all grounds around it. Why? Because the great prince who stands for the children of our people was in the bush. And the voice came from the bush saying, take your shoes off your feet, Moses, for this ground is what? Holy, Holy ground. The angel of the Lord, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your children, told that to Daniel. The fourth commandment contains the seal of God's law. It's the authority of that seal. A seal has a name in it, right? And the authority is, is mentioned there. And the territory, it's all mentioned in the fourth commandment. That's what a seal is. And it's the seal that gives the law its power and its authority. God's name. That is the authority behind the law. If it weren't for the fourth commandment, this could be anybody's law, right? It could be anybody's law. But what gives the law its authority is the Sabbath commandment, the place of God's name. First John 3, 4 says, let's, let's turn to it. I don't know if I can quote it just perfectly. First John 3, 4, you all know that verse. Right near Revelation, just before Revelation. First John 3, 4. Here's what it says. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what we're dealing with every day. We're dealing with the sin problem every day, right? How many of you sense that? We're dealing with a sin problem every day. <laughs> we're up to our armpits in sin because of our nature. And all it takes is the right circumstances and stuff comes boiling to the top, right? You ever notice that? Am I the only one? That's what we're dealing with. The devil knows that if the people who profess to be followers of God, have the law written in their hearts that his power will be broken. You know, uh, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that, right? If we don't allow the Holy Spirit to write his law in our hearts, that's a decision we make. And the devil knows that if God's law is written in our heart and in our mind, that his power will be broken. That's why he attacks God's law. Because his people are his church. How, how he hates God's law. The law points to our Savior. You all know Galatians 3 verse 24 says the law is the schoolmaster that was, does what? Leads us to Jesus. The law is our mirror. It lets us know what we are. And it, it makes us flee to him. Flee to Jesus. There's a song by that title. Flee to Jesus. And justified believers have the law in their hearts. That's what the new covenant promise is. Somebody said to me one day, I think to Jim and I, well, I'm a new covenant Christian now. So I need to worry about the law. But let's look. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, and see what a new covenant Christian is. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. I can't help resist reading verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least unto the greatest. The time is coming. When I won't say to Michael, know the Lord, he knows him too. God has a people on the earth. And uh, they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And then Hebrews 10, verse 16, he repeats it again. Starting with verse 15, Hebrews 10, verse 15, just over the page. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, 
For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. That's got to be a new covenant, doesn't it? After those days. Says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The law of God, which points out our sins, brings us to the Savior. And he says, I will not remember your sins and iniquities anymore. Isn't that great? In the new covenant, he promises to forgive every repentant sinner. That's huge. God promised, that's his covenant with us, that every repentant sinner would be a justified believer. Justification, as Paul uses it, is a word from the law courts. It means to be judged righteous before the law. That's what forgiveness is. Only those who are forgiven have the law in their hearts. Forgiveness is huge in this context. This is where the power of God, God is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes... This is the staging ground for the whole plan of salvation. And this battle is fought out every day in the hearts of true believers. And the focal point is the conflict. In this conflict is the battle for your mind and my mind. Good to have the law of God written there, doesn't it? Don't you think so? We can't write it there. But we give him permission to do that. And if the law of God is written in my mind, then uh, it's my law then. The Ten Commandments are God's idea. But when we allow him to write his law in our heart and in our mind, then it becomes our idea. And like uh, David, we'll love his law. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. No one can possibly take the law seriously who is not a justified believer. Can't take it seriously. But when you're a justified believer, you know what you've been delivered from. And uh, no one takes the law seriously unless they know the lawgiver. And who is that? Isaiah 33. And I'm going to close with this point. I'm halfway through my sermon. <laughs> and I don't want to keep anybody here until 1.30. So I'm going to close with this thought this morning. And we'll take up from here in two weeks. Be sure and come. Bring your neighbor. We're going to talk about the abomination that makes desolate in the end time. We need to know what that is. For Jerusalem, it was the armies that surrounded Jerusalem, right? You know, there's a little story behind all of that. Cestius was a Roman, was a Roman uh, captain, uh, general. About three and a half years before the city was destroyed, Cestius and the armies of Rome came and went around Jerusalem. They gathered around Jerusalem. They Laid a siege. People couldn't get, couldn't get food in, and, and it was a terrible time for the Jews. And all of a sudden, you know what happened? He leaves. He takes his armies and goes. And the, the Jewish zealots, the soldiers among the Jews, saw that as an opportunity. They opened the gates of Jerusalem, which had been shut for three and a half years. They opened the gates of Jerusalem. They went through those open gates and went after the Roman armies and killed a lot of them. You know what? Rome was the, Rome was the empire. They, they, they killed so, Roman soldiers. That's like going up to a grizzly bear and poking him with a sharp stick, right? <laughs> Three and a half years later, Titus came. And you know what Titus did? True to what Jesus had promised the disciples and the, and the Christians, the early Christians, when you see that happening, they, they leveled the city. So when Cestius came, the gates were opened and the Christians went out three and a half years before the real desolation. And not one Christian lost his life. What an idea. Do you think it's important for us to know about the desolation that's coming? Yes. You all come two weeks. We're going to finish this sermon. But I want to, I want to read a passage from Isaiah 33. Verse 22, you know, we have a friend in the court. Don't you love Isaiah? I would recommend Isaiah 40 through 45 as good recommended Sabbath afternoon reading. Isaiah, we're going to read 
Isaiah chapter 33, a little ways before that. Isaiah 33, verse 22. This is a, a passage that you want, might want to commit to memory of remembering where it is. Here's what it says. The Lord, for the Lord is our, what? Judge. judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. And he will save us. Who is that? Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He's the one who saves us. He came here. That's the substance of John 3, 16, right? The same one wrote his law on tables of stone. And he's our friend in court. In fact, in 1 John, it says that he's our advocate. Isn't that neat? And in John chapter 15, he says he's our friend. Would you like to have a friend in court? We're living in the hour of God's judgment. It's in a very, very important time right now in earth's history. Our dear nation is being humbled to the dust. And everywhere we look, there's destruction coming. Have you been watching about the floods and the fires? Cities and homes are being burned. Happening again, Jim and Janelle. You're refugees from that place in paradise. So uh, anyway, we're living in important times. Spend some time every day studying the word. Give your heart to God in the morning. You get tired of hearing me say this. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. If you'll do that, you will be on higher ground. Dear Father in heaven, we've been here this morning thinking about you, thinking about home. We long for you to come, O oh Father, in Jesus. When you come in the glory of the Father, we want to hear the Father sing and Jesus sing and the angels. We look forward to that wonderful day. We pray, Lord, that it'll be soon. Please finish your work in our hearts. Give us a desire every day to serve you. And uh, I pray that you'll be with those unfortunate places in our world right now. There are people suffering, Lord. We know it heart hurts your heart as well to see what the devil is stirring up in the planet. We know that the end must be soon and that you want to come. Father, I pray that you will be with each one of us here this morning in uh, ways that are just peculiar to us so that we can be overcomers, that we can be ready for your coming. And I pray these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.